Welcome back. Today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about curvature and normal vectors. Uh, and so today I want to start with a definition. So the definition is that capital T, we'll call this, of little t is called uh, the unit tangent vector. And uh, the way that we compute this capital T is capital T of little t is going to be equal to our velocity function divided by the magnitude of the velocity function. And notice that when any function is divided by its magnitude, it gives you a unit vector. And so we know that this is a unit vector because we're dividing it by its magnitude. And <coughs> velocity points uh, tangent to the curve. So uh, we know that if we had some curve in space, let's call this r of t, then, and we took a given point on there, then if we found r prime of t at this point, then that would be a tangent vector. So this would be r prime of t. And then what we do is we divide r prime of t by its magnitude to give you a unit vector pointing in that exact same direction um, that only has length one. So in other words, we're just getting direction out of this capital T. Uh, the magnitude is fixed at one. So this would be capital T of little t. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you would like, you could also think of it this way, that this is the velocity at t divided by the magnitude of the velocity at t, if you prefer thinking about it in terms of velocity instead of just the derivative of your original vector-valued function. Okay, uh, so that is how we compute a unit tangent vector, is you just take the derivative and then divide that derivative by its magnitude. All right, uh, another definition I'd like to share with you is definition the curvature <coughs> of a curve is typically um, we write this as a ultimately as the Greek letter kappa, but I'm just going to use a K because they look very similar. Uh, so K is equal to um, the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent with respect to S, where remember S was the arc length. Okay, where uh, t is the unit tangent vector. Okay. Um, so, what we'd like to be able to do is compute this uh, dt ds. Notice that typically our variable uh, or our independent variable that we're working with is little t, not little s. So we need to be able to compute um, this dt ds 
Um, and the way that I'm going to do that is the following. Well, dt over ds could be written as um, as what? Well, uh, first of all, let's look at um, that this could be written the following way, that this is dt over d little t uh, divided by uh, ds divided by d little t and that's by the chain rule. Um, so we could say that if I want to find the magnitude of that uh, quantity it would be the same as finding the magnitude of this quantity and of course this is just my curvature. So in other words what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the derivative of my unit tangent vector with respect to t and then divide that by ds dt. Now what is this thing ds dt? Um, ds dt is really equal to Okay, so let me rewrite this again. This is kind of like the derivative of my unit tangent and the magnitude of that divided by ds dt. But what we already know about ds dt is we can find that by taking the magnitude of the derivative of r of t, which of course is the speed okay so ds dt uh, is what we call our velocity the magnitude of ds dt is what we call our speed so another way of finding curvature is to take the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent and divide it by the magnitude of your velocity okay and that would give me my <coughs> curvature Okay, so now that we've got these two things, we've got this thing called the unit tangent. We've also got this new thought of curvature. And really, uh, when you're thinking about curvature, uh, the way that you should think of it is, well, it's the change in capital T. Well, what is capital T? It's really a direction. Right, because we've divided out magnitude, and so any vector consists of a direction and a magnitude. We've eliminated the magnitude, so you can think of capital T as pure direction. So what we're saying is it's the change in direction divided by the change in the length. So as you go a certain length, as you change length, how much does the direction change? So how tight are you bending, in other words? So how fast is the direction changing in respect to a small change in length? So the bendiness, in some sense, you could think of it as how quick is this curve bending? Uh, that's what we call curvature. And that makes some sense when you think about it in those terms. OK, let's do an example and kind of see how this works. Um, so an example, let's find the curvature of a circle of radius little a. Okay, so we want to find the curvature of a circle of radius A. Now a circle is in two dimensions, so we're just dealing with two-dimensional space right now. And so what I'd like to do is write this curve, R of T, which is a circle, uh, as a parametric equation in uh, I and J. So the way that you write a circle of radius A is the following. It's A cosine of t in the i direction plus a 
sine of t in the j direction. Okay, And I think that you would find that if you plug in various values for t, uh, this will trace out a circle of radius a. All right, so this is my parametric equation for the circle of radius a. Now I would like to um, go ahead and find the curvature. Now, what do I need to do in order to find curvature? Well, first of all, I need a unit tangent vector. Okay, but to find a unit tangent, I need a derivative of this function, r prime of t, and I also need the magnitude of that derivative. So let's start there. So what I want is first let's just take the derivative of r prime of t and I get the derivative of a cosine of t is um, negative a sine of t in the i direction plus the derivative of a sine of t is a cosine t in the j direction. Okay? Uh, and I also need the magnitude of r prime of t, which is equal to the square root of uh, the first component squared, so negative a sine t quantity squared, plus the second component squared, which is a cosine of t quantity squared, uh, which is equal to, so this is the square root of a squared sine squared t plus a squared cosine squared t. Uh, which is just equal to, well, I'm assuming in this case that the circle has radius a, so a is a positive number. So it's just the square root of a squared, and since a is positive, we know that that is a. So I have that r prime of t, I know that vector, and I also know the magnitude of that vector is a, and so I can find what we would call the unit tangent vector at any given point little t. And the way that I find that is I take the derivative r prime of t and I divide it by the magnitude uh, of r prime of t and I get so I'm just going to divide everything in the derivative by a, and that would just give me minus sine of t in the i direction plus cosine of t in the j direction. And that would be my unit tangent vector. Okay. So I've got my unit tangent, but I'm not done yet because that's not exactly what gives me my curvature, right? What does give me my curvature? My curvature is given by the derivative of the unit tangent, its magnitude, divided by the magnitude of the derivative of r. Okay, so maybe I'll write that again. We need to remember this, that what my unit tangent is. So let's write curvature again. The curvature at a point t is going to be the magnitude of t prime of t divided by the magnitude of r prime of t. Well, to figure that out, I suppose then, then I need to know what is t prime of t. I already know what t uh, of little t is, but I need to know what t prime is. So since the last one was uh, t of t had as the first component negative sine of t, and the derivative of negative sine of t is negative cosine of t 
in the i direction and the derivative of cosine of t is going to be negative sine of t in the j direction. So I have the derivative of my unit tangent, right? And so using that, I can find out what's the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent. Well, the magnitude of that derivative is going to be the square root of negative cosine of t quantity squared plus negative sine of t quantity squared, which is just cosine squared of t plus sine squared of t, which I know is just 1 by identity. And so this is 1. OK. Uh, I already know what the magnitude of r prime of t is. I computed it on the last slide, and I said that that was a. So if the curvature at a point t is equal to the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent divided by the magnitude of r prime of t, then that will just give me well, the magnitude of the unit tangent we said was 1, and the magnitude of the derivative we said was a. And so my curvature is 1 over a no matter what little t is. In other words, the curvature of a circle is constant. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if I draw my circle, all of these curvatures, the change in the curve itself as I move along, it's always the same. It's curving, it's bending, if you like, similarly at all points. So we would expect that the curvature of a circle is a constant, and in fact it is, and the curvature is 1 over the radius. Interesting. Okay, so that's very cool. Uh, let's look at another way of thinking about curvature. So another way of thinking about it, here's a theorem. The curvature of the curve given by the vector function Um, R is the following. The curvature of little t is equal to, um, so this is another way of thinking about curvature, is it's the magnitude of a cross product. So if I cross the first derivative and the second derivative of my original function and then take the magnitude and then I divide that by r prime of t quantity cubed. Okay, so uh, this is just another way of calculating the curvature. Both of these values um, are exactly the same. It doesn't matter which way you go. So uh, just so we can see how this works, let's do a quick example. So let me write an example down for us. So let's find the curvature. Of the function r of t is equal to 3t in the i direction plus 4 sine t in the j direction plus 4 cosine of t in the k direction. All right. Um, now, uh, given 
this example, what do we want to do? Well, there's two ways we can go. We could find the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent and then divide it by the magnitude of r prime. That's one way to go. The other way to go is to find a first derivative and a second derivative and then use some of the properties of the first and second derivative to find the curvature. I think in this case that might be a better way for us to go. So the first thing that I'd like to do in this problem is let's find a first derivative of this function and a second derivative of this function. Okay, let me rewrite this on another. So my original function, r of t, is equal to 3t i plus 4 sine of t j plus 4 cosine of t k. So if I take a first derivative of this vector valued function, I get 3i. Um, okay, so what's the derivative of 4 sine of t? I suppose that would be 4 cosine of t in the j direction plus uh, 4, the derivative of 4 cosine of t would be negative 4 sine of t in the k direction. And now I need a second derivative. So the derivative of 3 is just 0. So uh, I could just not write this at all because 3i is constant, but I, for our purposes I'm going to write that this is 0 in the i direction uh, plus the derivative of 4 cosine of t is negative 4 sine t in the j direction and the derivative of negative 4 sine of t is negative 4 cosine t in the k direction. All right, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the cross product of the derivative and the second derivative. All right, so I'd like to take r prime of t and cross that vector with the vector r double prime of t. And typically the way that I do cross products is I take the determinant of a matrix I put i, j, and k up top. Then I put the first vector in the second row, which is 3, 4 cosine t, negative 4 sine t. And then the second vector goes in the last row. So I get 0, negative 4 sine t, negative 4 cosine t. And now I'm going to use uh, my horseshoe method to take this cross product and I will get, let's start writing things down, the first one is right here. So I get 4 cosine t times negative 4 cosine t which is negative 16 cosine squared of t times i. Okay, the second horseshoe goes here and picks up that zero. So zero times anything is zero, so I'll just leave that one out. Then I get this horseshoe here, here, here. So I get negative 12 sine t times k. Okay, now we go the other direction, and all of these are negative. So I'll just write in minus and subtract all these. The first one, I get 0. The second horseshoe I get is here. So I get negative 12 um, cosine t. Oops. 12 cosine t um, times j. And then the last horseshoe is right here, which is plus 16 
sine squared t uh, times i. OK, so let's rewrite this and combine terms. Uh, I've got negative 16 cosine squared of t, and I've got minus 16 sine squared of t, both in the i direction. Those combine, and I just get out of that negative 16 i. OK, uh, then I have something in the j direction. It's negative, negative 12 cosine of t. So that's plus 12 cosine of t in the j direction. And then I get uh, minus 12 sine of t in the k direction. Mm. OK. So that gives me the cross product. I don't want just the cross product. I want the magnitude of the cross product. So now I'd like to know what's the magnitude of r prime of t cross with r double prime of t. Well, that's the square root of negative 16 squared plus 12 cosine of t squared plus negative 12 sine of t squared. Uh, if I combine this guy and this guy, what will I get? Uh, that will end up being 144. So this is the square root of 16 squared plus 144 which is the square root of 400, otherwise known as 20. OK, so the magnitude of r prime of t cross r double prime of t ends up being 20. OK, we need to remember that. And then the other thing that I need to know is what's the magnitude of just r prime of t? Well, the magnitude of r prime of t uh, is the square root of uh, 3 squared plus 4 sine t squared uh, plus negative 4 cosine of t squared. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. Did I? I wrote that in the wrong order. Um, do, 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 do. This is supposed to be a negative. This is supposed to be a positive. Um, OK, so this is, uh, and this is the J component. This is the K component. I mixed up that order. I apologize, but everything's OK. Uh, so let's go ahead and figure this out. So this is the square root of 9. And then when I square 4, I get 16. So 16 sine squared of t plus 16 cosine squared of t is just otherwise known as 16. So this is the square root of 25, otherwise known as 5. OK, what am I trying to figure out here? I've got all the pieces of the puzzle. I want to know what is the curvature. Well, the curvature at t is the cross product of r prime of t with r double prime of t divided by the magnitude of r prime of t quantity cubed. And we figured out that the magnitude of r prime of t cross r double prime of t we figured out that that was 20. And the magnitude of r prime of t, we said that's 5. But we want to cube that. So this is 20 divided by 125, which could also be written as 4 
divided by 25. And we get this nice curvature in three dimensions. The first one was, the first example we did was just a circle in two dimensions. This was some sort of like a helix in three dimensions, which also has a nice constant curvature across the entire helix. So that's very nice. Uh, so those are some good examples. Now, now that we have this thing called the unit tangent vector, there are some other important vectors that I can tell you about, about as well. The first one uh, we call the normal vector. Okay, so let's start. Since we know that the magnitude of the unit tangent vector is kind of trivially one, right? Because we said it's a unit tangent vector, so its length is one. We know that that's true for all um, values of little t. Then we have um, that t of t uh, dotted with t prime oops not x we want that to be t of t uh, is equal to well what would those two dot together to give me well the derivative of the unit tangent is in fact a derivative. A derivative is by definition orthogonal to the original curve. So if T of capital T of little t is a curve, uh, this is the derivative of that curve which give, is orthogonal to the original curve. So this by definition must be zero. Okay, so we have that t prime of t is orthogonal to uh, capital T of t. Okay, um, now if I have a curve that's orthogonal to my unit tangent then I could talk about the unit vector that's orthogonal to my unit tangent. And so let me write this down as a definition. Uh, the principal unit normal vector Typically, we call this one capital N of T. If you want to put a little vector sign over the top. I don't always remember vector signs, but oftentimes I should. Uh, so this is N of T is N of T is equal to the derivative of the unit tangent divided by the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent, which does not necessarily need to be 1. But once I divide the derivative of the unit tangent by its magnitude, I definitely get something that has magnitude 1. So this new vector called the normal vector has magnitude 1 as well. So t uh, capital T, which is the unit tangent, is tangent to the curve, and the unit normal is what we call normal to the curve, or uh, orthogonal to the curve, if you like. Let me draw a little picture for you, just to show you how this works. Okay, so let's say that I have a curve. Here's a curve in space. Uh, and we'll call this curve R 
of t. If I look at a given point on that curve, then we have, uh, and let's say that we're traveling along this curve in a certain direction, okay, then I'm going to have a tangent vector to that curve. And if I divide that tangent vector by its magnitude, then I get my unit tangent vector. So I can kind of think of it, maybe I'll draw this in a different color. Draw this one red. This is what I would call my unit tangent. So this is capital T of T. It's my unit tangent. Then I could take the derivative of the unit tangent and divide it by its magnitude, and I would get another curve. And this one is going to be orthogonal to the unit tangent. And in fact, I kind of have two directions that this one could point. It could point out. Uh, in the opposite direction that I've drawn or the direction I've drawn, uh, why did I choose this direction? Because the what we call the unit normal, it always points in the direction that the curve is bending. Okay, uh, let me say that again, that the unit normal vector points in the direction the curve is bending, not away from the bend. So it's kind of saying which way. So think of it this way. The unit tangent, um, this guy, he points in the direction the particle is actually going at that moment. The unit normal points in the direction that the particle is turning at that moment. Okay, So that gives you some information. This is the way we're going. This is the way we're turning. Okay, so we can find these two vectors, our unit tangent and our unit normal. Okay. So let's do give you one more definition here. Um, another definition is the vector we call this one capital B of T which is equal to the cross of the unit tangent with the unit normal Okay, is called the binormal. Vector. And the binormal vector is a vector that is normal to the unit tangent and to the normal vector. Okay, so if the tangent vector is pointing in one direction, the normal vector is pointing in a normal direction to that first direction, then there's one more vector that you could draw that is uh, orthogonal to both of those. That vector we call the binormal vector. Okay, um, so notice that this vector B is uh, perpendicular to uh, T and capital N. So it's perpendicular to T and it's perpendicular to N. Also, it is a unit vector. Uh, how do we know that it's a unit vector? Well, t and n 
both of these vectors up here, they're unit vectors, right? So I've got a vector t, and I've got a vector n, and these form a parallelogram. But remember, this one has length 1, this one has length 1, so the parallelogram that they make is 1 by 1. And I know that the magnitude of the cross of those is the area of that parallelogram. So the magnitude of t of t cross n of t is equal to the area of this parallelogram that's one by it's one by one and it's a right angle. That's just a square of uh, side with side length one, so that's just one. But I know that one then is also equal to the magnitude of b of t. Okay, so we know uh, that this binormal vector, which we call b of t, also has length one. Okay, um, let's do one more example and then um, you'll be ready to do some homework. All right, in this example we'd like to find the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector for this curve. Okay, uh, just the general unit tangent and the general unit normal. So uh, we need to remember what is the unit tangent. So we could put vector signs over the top of these guys if we want to. Uh, so this is just going to be r prime of t prime uh, uh, divided by the magnitude of r prime of t. So we need to find r prime of t. So r prime of t is equal to uh, the derivative. So that's going to be uh, t um, negative 3, 0. And the magnitude of r prime of t is going to be equal to the square root of t squared plus negative 3 squared plus 0 squared, which is the square root of t squared plus 9. Okay, so this um, uh, this unit tangent is just going to be equal to t divided by the square root of t squared plus 9 i uh, plus, oh, I guess I could say minus 3 over the square root of t squared plus 9 j um, plus 0 k. All right, and we've got our unit tangent vector. All right, so um, now I'd like to find a unit normal vector. And the unit normal is going to be found by taking a derivative of um, my unit tangent, which is sitting right here, and then dividing it by its magnitude. Okay, so um, let's, we need to remember what this is when I go to my next slide. So let's just remember this. It's So t of t is equal to t over square root t squared plus 9 i uh, minus 3 over square root t squared plus 9 j plus 0 k. And so to find my unit normal, I'm going to need to take the derivative of this function. 
So this is a quotient, so I need to use the quotient rule, so it's the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is 1, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. Now the derivative of the bottom will be 1 half t squared plus 9 to the negative 1 half times the derivative of what's inside, which is 2t, divided by the bottom squared, which is t squared plus 9. Okay, and that's in the i direction. We can clean that up a little bit, but let's just wait a second. Um, and then in the j direction, we have similarly minus the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is 0, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is 1 half t squared plus 9 to the negative 1 half times 2t divided by the bottom squared, which is t squared plus 9. All right. Uh, this is in the j direction, and then, of course, we have nothing in the k direction. Okay. Can we clean this up a little bit? Um, so what do we have? I would like to combine this into one fraction if I could. Okay, it will make life a lot easier on me. Um, so this thing, let's look at this whole top. Uh, I could multiply the top and the bottom of this first term right here by the square root of t squared plus 9. If I did, then I'd get that this is t squared plus 9 over the square root of t squared plus 9. Uh, then I've got a 2 on bottom, a 2 on top, those cancel. Then I have minus um, t squared over um, square root t squared plus 9 divided by t squared plus 9, okay, uh, in the i direction, minus. This is all 0. And so this, and I've got a 2 on the bottom, 2 on the top. So on the top here, I get a 3t. So I've got 3t divided by the square root of t squared plus 9 divided by t squared plus 9 in the j direction. And of course, I have 0 in the k direction. OK, uh, this is equal to. Um, if I combine these, notice I have a t squared minus a t squared. So on top here, I just have 9. Uh, and then, of course, this is over 1. So I have a fraction divided by a fraction. But let's, uh, so I could write this as 9 over square root of t squared plus 9 times flip and multiply. Um, and I get 1 over t squared plus 9 in the i direction. This is going to be uh, minus 3t over square root t squared plus 9 times 1 over t squared plus 9 in the j direction plus 0 in the k direction. Okay, notice that right here, that's just t squared plus 9 to the 3 halves, right? So I could write this as, uh, I don't really have room, but I'll erase some up at the top so that I can keep going without erasing. So this is equal to uh, 9 over t squared plus 9 
to the 3 halves in the i minus 3t over t squared plus 9 to the 3 halves in the j plus 0 in the k. And this is what I would call t prime of t. If I want the normal vector n of t, then I want to take t prime of t and divide it by the magnitude of t prime of t. And so I need to know the magnitude of t prime of t. Okay. So what is the magnitude of t prime of t? It would be the square root of uh, 9 over t squared plus 9 uh, to the 3 halves squared plus negative 3t over um, t squared plus 9 to the 3 halves squared plus 0 squared. Uh, but this is equal to, this is square root of 81 divided by, when I square uh, something to the 3 halves, it's just cubed. This is t squared plus 9 quantity cubed, okay, uh, plus if I square th negative 3t, I get 9t squared. And on the bottom, if I square it, I get t squared plus 9 quantity cubed, which is the square root of, um, if I combine these two, I get 9t squared um, plus 81 divided by t squared plus 9 quantity cubed. What is the top? 9t squared plus 81 is 9 times t squared plus 9. So 1 of the t squareds plus 9 cancels on the bottom and I get the square root. On top I just get a 9. On bottom I get a t squared plus 9 quantity squared which reduces down to 3 on top and t squared plus 9 on the bottom. And that is my magnitude of t prime of t. So um, if I want to find t prime of t divided by the magnitude of t prime of t, then I need to divide each component of t prime of t by this magnitude. Okay, so this is going to be, um, I'm going to divide by that magnitude. In other words, I could multiply by the reciprocal of that magnitude. So I'm going to take t squared plus 9 over 3 times 9 over t squared plus 9 to the 3 over 2 comma, negative 3t over t squared plus 9 to the 3 over 2, comma, 0. So if I multiply through by t squared plus 9 over 3, some nice things happen, and I get something relatively nice. Let me write it down for you. I will get that this is equal to, uh, if I multiply through this guy to this one, I get the 3 and the 9 cancel and give me a 3 on top. And on the bottom, I just get the square root of t squared plus 9. Because this is 1 and a half t squared plus 9. Okay, second component would be the threes cancel. 
So I get a negative t on top, and on the bottom I would get the square root of t squared plus 9. And then if I multiply the 0 by anything, I just get 0. So here is my unit normal vector in. Now, uh, as you can see, this isn't exactly just the easiest thing you've ever done. But, uh, and it takes a little time sometimes to find these vectors, but we can certainly do it. And, uh, and now you're ready to go on some homework.